Thank you, Caleb, so much. Wow, I'm really humbled and honored to be able to share some time with you today. I'm gonna move these right now because they're really noisy and wow, really water spotted. That's embarrassing, okay? Um, so today, I just wanna take a minute just to share with you a little bit about who I am. You're like, okay, Matt, you've seen you do announcements a couple of times and you harass us to pack shoe boxes in October, November, and you invite us to your gathering a couple times a year when we see you, but who are you? So I have a seven, by the way, uh, fellow gathering leaders, I'm giving you my favorite little icebreaker, a little seven word biography. Okay, a little seven-word biography. And here's who I am in seven words. I am the youngest in my family, right? My siblings are 10 and 13 years older than I am. So, you know, that says right away, man, this guy is super needy and he expects to get his way, right? That just screams that right at the beginning. Secondly, I am an orphan. Now, man, that sounds really sad. No, I just lost my parents when I was young. That's just the pathway. That's what God had for my life. And he gave me those older siblings that have really shaped who I am, but let me just tell you, that burns in an extra level of selfishness and, and neediness, right? Like, that's just part of who I am as well. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. Like, the, the center of my life is to serve the Lord. That's what I want. I am Buckeye. I'm Buckeye by birth, Buckeye by education, um, Buckeye in that this is Ohio's where I've spent most of my life. Um, some ministry assignments have led me to New York and to Arizona, but then somehow we wound up back here in the Dayton area where I grew up. I went to Bethel Township Schools as a kid, graduated from Stebbins High School. And yeah, and here we are uh, years later, right? Um, <laughs> serving the Lord here. I'm, I have a family. I have an amazing family. Uh, married to Jamie. Wow. I, I thought you were serving in kids ministry today. What a cool thing. You thought you were too. What a cool thing. Wow, my son William's here. I love my family so much. Um, a lot of the decisions of my life about where I've served in ministry have been because of that. As Caleb said, I served as a pastor for a long time. I was adding it up to prep for today. And my goodness, it was like 17, 18 years. And I don't feel like I'm old enough for that to be possible. But I am. Right, like so, I served as a pastor for a long time. Um, led into youth ministry at first, and then lots of other jobs. I'm going to share about that in more detail in a minute. And lastly, a coach. I coach people. I love to coach people. I love more than I love my own success. I love when someone else, the light bulb goes off and they get it. I love that. I love that. I love to inspire people and encourage people to be great. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today as well. So, like I said, 18-ish years as a pastor, and Caleb, I think you said something like this a couple of weeks ago. People don't knock on the pastor's door to set up an appointment to chat theology. So like in 18 years of this, I'm think, I think someone made an appointment to talk about theological stuff exactly one time. And it was my first pastoral assignment, okay, as a youth pastor up in the Columbus area. These two junior, senior, that age guys came in. And these were kids who were um, just a real invested in our, our ministry there and leading worship. But they're like, Matt, we got some stuff about who God is that we just want to sort out. And like stuff like, where did the Bible come from? And just walking through all that. That was a fun day. But since then, that rarely is the subject that pastors encounter. It's more like, what am I going to do about my marriage? What am I going to do about my job? My, uh, this addiction issue I have. The biggest question, though, where people like carve out time to meet with the pastor and it's such a, it's, okay, I'll just speak for me. You know, people meet you when you're the pastor, they meet you here, right? And they see you as this person who's put together these thoughts and has thoughtful ideas to share. And they think, man, that is a person who must really have his life together. So I need to go talk to this person about how to have my life together. And as they come to me, I'm like, oh my goodness, you've made a terrible mistake today. <laughs> Like, I'm, I'm searching, too, for the big answers to my life. 
But people most often come, tell me, what am I gonna do with my life? I got, that, I got asked that question a lot. And I have really good news today. For every person in this room, I have a very clear, biblical message for you about God's number one calling for your life. Okay? Now that I have you up on the edge of the seat though, we gotta move on a little bit because we're gonna circle back around to that. When I talk about today calling and purpose and mission, and over the last few weeks as Caleb and Dylan have been teaching, they've just revealed, yeah, sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this area of calling and purpose and mission and what our life is supposed to be about. Because there are words, the words you just heard me use, calling, purpose, mission. You heard Caleb use the word assignment earlier, right? In scripture, and our English text, those all show up as calling. The big, big, big calling on your life, the very specific small assignment, it's all calling. So what does that really mean to us? Sometimes it's vocational, sometimes it's for a specific mission. And we can mess up by kind of using just that one word calling for every single thing. Sometimes like you will hear someone say, yeah, the calling of my life is to do whatever. Or they'll use it in a very, um, you know, very micro way. I do not feel called to help you move your furniture this weekend. (laughs) Right? And those are very different things. And we, it can get confusing when you stick the same word to both of those things, right? A couple of weeks ago, Dylan in particular, just crushed it. Put that chart up that Dylan shared with us. There we go. The chart um, about Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. There it is, nice. If you didn't catch the sermon a couple of weeks ago, you need to go back, go, go to YouTube, go to our, our website, watch it. While you're there, what is it, um, Like, subscribe, follow, right? Do that while you're there too, okay? But watch it because Dylan carves out beautifully, like how do you recognize when, you know, something is coming from God or not? And he gives the example of Zerubbabel and his his calling to to love and to be faithful to the Father, to be a builder and a leader, and then the assignment to rebuild the temple, restore worship. Ezra, right, there's calling, Reconciling people back to God. His assignment, teaching the law. Reconciling Israel back to God. And then Nehemiah. Right, the, I think that often in scripture, the person we think of most is for, as far as rallying people for a task to accomplish something great for God's glory. And he was called. And his assignment, rebuild the wall. Really, great message. You need to go rewatch it because what I want to share with you today, it fits in a lot with that. I want to sharpen how we think about the concepts, though, of God's calling on our life in three words, okay? Calling, purpose, and mission. And the number one thing I want you to know today is that God has a specific calling, purpose, and mission for every single person. He writes it out in Jeremiah 29, 11, right? We love this verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you future and a hope. Man, we love these verses. We love that verse. That is a verse that is amazing to embroider on a pillow, right? Or to hang on your wall, or to have, you know, like that's a good poster to put, or a good verse to put like a, a beautiful imagery as the wallpaper on your laptop, right? Now, I love this verse. Also, I want you to know, we take it really out of context, okay? You're like, what? I can't use it? No, you can use this verse. Let me explain it to you, though. This verse, it's written for us, but it's not written specifically to us, Okay? This is written to people of Israel, the Hebrew people, while they are in exile. They're in exile because they weren't following God. And the natural consequences of not following God is you're going to find yourself very far from him and in a world of hurt 
And that's where they were. They were in this very anti-God Babylonian society that had just taken them over. And Jeremiah is saying to them, hey, you guys, God's got a good plan for you. It doesn't feel like it right now. God has a good plan for you, plans for hope and a future. Plans where you're not in exile. Now, that's the why it was written. What does that mean to us? Well, God does have plans for us. But this isn't the same kind of promise to us that it was to Israel. Because of God's perfection as our heavenly father and his care for us so beautifully, he has plans for us. And his plans aren't invested in our misery his plans are in our hope and in our future and what's, what's good for us and what's good for the kingdom. Okay? So, please continue. Embroider your pillows. Make it your wall. But just know, and I would say this is true everywhere in Scripture, as we claim these promises, make sure they're promises to us and then ask yourself the question, what's the bigger, if it's not a promise specifically to me, what's the bigger picture that I can draw from this? Okay? We know that God is for us and he does have plans for us and he does have hope for us. And as I said, God has a specific calling and purpose and mission for every single one of us. And secondly, God is not keeping this a secret. God's calling, God's purpose, God's mission for you is not, oh, I'm gonna drink loose leaf tea and then see what the tea leaves say and I'll figure that out. No, he's he's got it for us. It's not hidden. It's not hidden. He wants us to know that. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to follow him in the way that he made us to be. So I've got these bowls here. My friend and kind of mentor life coach, Chris McCluskey. Chris is kind of the father of American Christian life coaching. He was a counselor and he says, this is not it. And he just started pursuing life coaching, which was totally in the secular world at that time. There wasn't this, a concept of Christian life coaching until Chris kind of brought that into our world. He founded the, the Professional Christian Coaching Institute. And man, Chris, smart guy. And um, this is a, a concept that um, another coach taught to him and I forgot her name. So I'm just gonna have to attribute it to a Chris today, okay? And it's this idea of these nesting bowls, right? That who we are as a person, different things nest inside of us, okay? And the first one is related to our calling, the calling of every single person. That God wants all of us to know him. That is the calling. God wants us to know him. As a little kid, the church I went to, this very fundamentalist Baptist church, um, which I'm so thankful for because they really taught me to love the word of God. I remember as a, a, a Sunday morning when I was six, they did something special in kids' ministry that day. They got all the kids together, kindergarten through fifth grade, and one of the leaders of the church very clearly spelled out the gospel message. And that day, I, rem- I remember is February 10th, 1976. Yes, I'm that old. Um, I surrendered my heart to Jesus. I said, Jesus, you know, in a, in a very kids ministry sort of way, right? In a, the understanding that a six-year-old has. I've done bad things. I need a savior. Please save me. And, you know, that was the end of my um, spiritual development in some ways for many years. You know, I continued to go to church, but it was, you know, um, it wasn't this very present center thing. And then as a, um, as a high school student, I was at this youth retreat as a high school junior. And my dear friend and mentor, Chris Brown, shared with me about how you can fake it in your life. And the people in your church world will never know how much you are faking it the rest of the week. And the people in your work world, or in this case, school world, who's referring to, will never know how much you are faking it on Sunday. But you can't fake it to God. He sees you all seven days. And he preached from, uh, 
Romans 12, 1 and 2, and my joke that my, my wife and I have made is that I've only ever preached on this passage, right? And that passage is, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you can discern what the will of God is is good and acceptable and perfect. And then this thought from uh, 2 Peter 2.9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. But he's patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The calling the big bowl. The calling for your life is to be fully surrendered to Jesus. The calling God has placed for your life, every, I'm looking, I'm on purpose, front to back, every section right now. The calling that God has placed in every one of your lives is to be fully surrendered to him. That's all he wants, full surrender. The first pastor I worked for used to describe what it means to be a Christian of taking everything I know about myself as a person and laying it on everything that I know about Jesus. That's the kind of surrender God wants from us. That's the kind of surrender it's talking about in Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you think about the concept of a sacrifice, right? The animal that was being sacrificed, it was fully surrendered. It was giving all that it knew to give. And in that poor animal's case, not knowing specifically what was happening. Paul writes there in Romans, hey, I want you to be an alive sacrifice. Where all of you is surrendered to him. We're just, you just say, hey, Jesus, I don't know where this is going. But I know I'm a sinful person who needs forgiveness. I repent and I surrender all I am to you. You'll notice that the calling for life is saying, well, you need to definitely, you know, fix yourself all up perfectly and then come to me. Nope. And there's no like description of church attendance in that passage, right? It's just saying, God, I don't, I don't know much. I know kind of who I am. And Jesus, I know kind of who you are. And I'm just surrendering all of that to you. Rescue me, save me from my sin. Give me your life. Guys, that's the calling. If you've never thought about this before, or thought about this in this way, Today, let this be the day that you make that kind of surrender over to God. When we worship sometimes, right, we lift our hands up, right? As I said, I went to like fundamentalist Baptist church. I didn't grow up with a lot of that, right? As times have gone on though, I'm more comfortable with that now. And like, it's part of like trying to draw close to God. I think it also is kind of saying, hands up, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. That's the call. If you're hearing my voice right now, that's the calling God has for your life to be surrendered to him. You may be thinking, Matt, yes, I'm in. There's lots of questions I still have. There's lots of stuff that doesn't add up. But let me just share you a little bit of my story. Surrender my life to Jesus. Circumstances led me for God to invite me to work in ministry, right? I was called, right, into, at the, at the time, youth ministry, you know? And this pastor um, who I was serving with, the same one who gave you that definition of what it means to be a Christian, all that you know about yourself, surrendered to all that you know about Jesus. I'm working as a youth pastor, and we're talking about this idea of spiritual gifts. And this guy, um, this pastor, he is a spiritual hero to me. 
like just wildly influential in my life. Like so much I can attribute to his leadership and teaching. I remember him saying to me one day, Matt, you can't be a leader because you don't have the spiritual gift of leadership. What? Wow. That's kind of, a, for a young man, kind of a gut punch. Like, I, I'm surrendered to God. I'm supposed to use my life for ministry. Tell me I can't be a leader. And then remember my biography earlier, youngest born, orphan. I'm going to show you, was my thoughts. I'm going to show you. And I started leading the way I saw him lead. And let me tell you what that resulted in. Because of other giftings and skills in my life, I was pretty effective in my job as a youth pastor. But not what I could be. Not what I could be. And after a season, I served with, with that church, and then God moved me to a church up in New York where I served there for a long time. Oh my goodness, this was the, the chaos where I was at this church. And, um, you know, it was a church of about 500 when we showed up there, and I was there as a youth pastor. And in a couple, uh, over seven years, it grew to a church of about 750, right? Good, steady, manageable, incremental growth in a part of the world like Hudson Valley, New York, not exactly buckle of the Bible belt, okay? Right, like Protestant church was like an outlier for people there. And then, kaboom, the rocket ship took off. And in a span of three years, it grew from a church of about 700 to a church of about 2,000. Caleb, our church's name was an outreach magazine. 100 fastest growing churches in America, right? Like that's what every pastor dreams of, right? It was terrible. People coming to know Jesus was awesome. Okay? Our, our, our baptism services were like European football matches. <laughs> Lots of people there. Ba they share their story. People getting baptized and the crowd going wild. It was awesome. But the atmosphere, it was a grind. It was grinding me out. It was crushing me because I was trying to lead as a person that I wasn't. And it wasn't really fitting with, I felt this great incongruity between what I was doing and how I felt about it. And it was hard. And so I started working with a coach. Fran is her name. She is a master life coach. Smart, smart lady. And through uh, our first couple consultations, after doing a little bit of kind of personality and background assessment, here's two statements. I, like, these are quotes. I remember, they burned into my head right away. She says to me, Matt, you think people like you, but they don't. <laughs> well, I was coming to you, Fran, for some help about how to like, you know, not be burning out. What is this? And then she said, Matt, I bet you have great bursts of activity and effectiveness, followed by long lulls of listlessness. And I thought, wow, that's really poetic, Fran. Long lulls of listlessness, that's beautiful. But man, yes, like she, it was like she had been with me every day my whole life. And through working with her, it helped me discover, yeah, it's because I'm not really serving in the way God made me. My purpose, my calling was clear. Disciple of Jesus, surrendered to him. My purpose was confusing. I hadn't landed on that yet. Do good church ministry, right? But I didn't know what my purpose was. Purpose I'm going to share with you my purpose statement in a minute. As you think about your purpose, purpose is the intersection of your personality and your giftings and your passions and your calling. And what's your calling? Full surrender to Jesus. The purpose then takes and adds in your personality. That's the way God made you. Your giftings that God gave to you. Your passions, the stuff you're wild about. 
That's where your purpose lies. Taking that surrender and adding who I am to it. Hey, go ahead and put my own life's purpose statement up there. So the purpose of my life is to make the world a more God-honoring and effective place. Okay, originally that's what it was. The period, bang, it was right there. But I was starting, I realized, hey, you know, I've got this spiritual gift of encouragement. And people come to me seeking counsel and, and God gives me some wisdom to say to them. So I've got this gifting of wisdom, which I'd never even considered before because if I'm gonna be a leader, I must have the spiritual gift of leadership. So I tried to cultivate that gift, which wasn't really there. By the way, if you don't have the gift of leadership, you can lead, okay? Okay? You hear me on this? A lots of, lot, and we'll get to this in a minute, and lots of the spiritual gifts that are in scripture, God gives a supernatural anointing on that area of gifting. And then there are other places in scripture where it commands everybody to do that thing. Okay? We'll talk about that in a minute though. I discovered yeah, I am an encourager. That's what God has, has empowered me to do. I have wisdom. That's what God has empowered me to share with people. And so I added, as I also got some training as a coach. So for a long time then it was, the purpose of my life is to make the world, and I don't know where that came from, this whole idea like it's a global purpose for my life. I'd never really, but God laid that on my heart. Like I'm passionate for the people of the world to come to know Jesus, to be more God honoring, to be more effective in what they do. And then for a while it was just through coaching because that was gonna be my next vocational step, right? I was gonna coach people. I got training in coaching. And then even it got modified again just three weeks ago, sitting right around there. I was really self-conscious because I was punching a lot of notes into my phone and I was sitting a little closer than I usually sit. But God said, Matt, in your purpose, you've got to talk about these giftings that God has given you. So now you've got this statement. The purpose of my life is to make the world a more God-honoring and effective place using my gifts of wisdom and encouragement through coaching. It's always kind of in process. You guys, every person in this room has, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have spiritual giftings. If you are a created being, you have a personality. God wired that into you. You have things that make your heart beat fast. Right? Things are like, yeah, I love that. Passion areas for you. So I have other purposes in my life too. I'm a husband. I'm a dad, I'm an employee, I'm a friend. But kind of, as I look at the big picture of my life, it's through I'm a surrendered follower of Jesus who uses these gifts of encouragement and wisdom to coach people to be more God-honoring and effective. That shows up in my marriage, that shows up in my parenting, that shows up in my workplace. But that's the purpose. This purpose rests inside of God's vision for my life. And I'm closer to wholeness. I'm not three pieces now. I'm closer to wholeness. For you as you're, as you're sussing out what, what God's purpose is for your life. Some questions to ask about your personality. Who are you? Are you more of an introvert, more of an extrovert? Are you talker or are you listener? <clears throat> are you an analyzer or a disruptor? Are you more physical like you do stuff, or more thoughtful, think about stuff? Are you more playful or more stoic, more serious? God gave you those things. It may shock you, I'm an extrovert. <laughs> extrovert doesn't mean that I have to talk Extrovert means I'm energized by being around people. Introvert does not mean I'm afraid of people. No, it means my tank is drained by being with people. 
I'm filled, my wife is deep introvert. I'm filled up by being with people. Jamie, sometimes we're with a lot of people. She comes home too peopley. She says it's too peopley. She just needs some alone time because that's what fills up her tank, right? So what's your personality? What are your spiritual gifts? All right, so this is a whole sermon series. We talk about this in, in, in um, Starting Line, right? So if you want more about this, you should stay and have lunch today and go to Starting Line. Is that today? We'll say it's today even if it's not because that way everyone stays for Starting Line, right? But spiritual gift, in essence, are these giftings, these abilities that at the time that you come to follow Jesus, God just anoints you with this supernatural power in. As I talk about being an encourager, I don't realize I'm being an encourager. My friend Josh, who's part of the staff team here, he says, Matt's the most encouraging person I know. That's so humbling because I don't realize I'm an encourager. I'm super selfish. That's like, that is a character flaw of mine. I am, when, a, when bad news is delivered to a group of people, my first thought is how does that impact me? I'm super selfish. This encouragement, it is just from the Holy Spirit. That's all. That's all. And there are lots of spiritual gifts that are named very clearly in Scripture. Okay? There are also thoughts that maybe there's some other spiritual giftings that aren't so specifically delineated in Scripture. Here's my answer for you. I don't know. I'm glad I don't know because God is way too big and vast for me to understand everything about him. So there's always more for me to learn. There's always more for me to grow. I would hate to think I could explain everything of God. That means he's not any smarter than I am. And I am not smart, y'all. So these giftings, you've got them. What do you do that God just shows up for? For me, encouragement is my number one gifting. Let me give you an example of someone using their, their spiritual gifts. Billy Graham. I went to a Billy Graham um, um, crusade in Columbus in the early 90s. And I was, okay, so I work for like kind of a cousin ministry of, the, of Billy Graham right now. So I, I don't, okay, maybe pause recording on this for a second. It was the worst sermon I've ever heard. <laughs> I've never heard a pastor use the phrase 11thly before. 11thly. And that was like middle of the sermon. There was more to go. And then he shares the gospel. And what happens? Thousands of people come to know Jesus. Wow. God, forgive me for underestimating the gifting, the spiritual gift of evangelism you've put in the life of someone else. I remember being at Nutter Center. We took teenagers, I was a youth pastor, we took teenagers to this Word of Life all-night youth rally event. It started with a Dayton Bombers game. Again, telling you exactly how old I am, right? And so we're there after the game, and they have this evangelist come and share the gospel. And he says, I'm not going to talk for long, and I'm not going to ask you to do anything. And then he talked for an hour and asked for people to make a decision and come forward at the end. I had 100 kids, most of them unchurched kids. The whole wrestling team from the high school where I was youth pastor in that community, was there, the whole wrestling team. Burly, cauliflower ear dudes, okay? I'm like, oh no, this is a disaster. And when he invites them, what happens? A couple dozen kids from the wrestling team gave their hearts to Jesus that night. God, how dare I criticize what someone else is doing when they're exercising their gift? So you've got giftings, y'all. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have spiritual giftings. What are they? I don't know. As you're narrowing it down, they'll ask you two things. What do you love to do and what are you good at? In my current job with Operation Christmas Child, we interview prospective volunteers. Those are the first two questions. What do you love to do and what are you good at? Those things are very revealing about where your giftings might be. So what are your personality? What is your giftings? What is your, what is your passion? Like I said, I get passionate about people following Jesus. I get passionate about people coming to know the Lord. I get passionate about people, helping people detangle problems in their lives. 
those passions come together. And where the intersection of all these together, that is your purpose. But Matt, you still haven't answered the big question. What am I supposed to do with my life? That's the mission bowl. It's the smallest bowl. You know why it's smallest? This, by the way, this isn't the only three bowls in this set. There are two other bowls in here. There are other bowls that you can swap out. Mission gets swapped out. I was, a volu- I was a banker and volunteer youth worker. That was my mission for a while. Then I was youth pastor. That was my vision for a while. Then I was adult ministries pastor. That was my vision for, or my mission for a while. I had the mission to be an executive pastor. What? <laughs> Overseeing facilities and grounds at a church. The first thing I did was build a great team to run the finances and a great team to run the grounds because I can't do any of that. I got like a D in accounting. That wasn't in my interview though, so whatever. Um, (laughs) The mission changes, but it's directly related to what your purpose is. So show the slide of the world there for a sec. This is what I do now. I coach people. I coach volunteers in the state of Michigan plus Toledo, Ohio to accomplish their goals for Operation Christmas Child. And as a result, every minute, five kids come to know Jesus. Now, as I was some knucklehead pastor sitting in New York trying to make sense of my life, God gave me this make the world a more God-honoring place. And I don't know where that came from, but it came from him. And years later, it's here. It's in this. That as I coach Meg up in northern Michigan, and she encourages people to pack boxes and builds a team there. There's 15,000 boxes that are going to kids and every single time they hear the gospel. That's making the world a more God-honoring and effective place. And I'm coaching her to accomplish her passions in ministry so kids can hear the gospel. Our church packed 300 boxes. 300 kids heard the gospel this year because of that. Like, let that sink in. 300 kids heard the gospel. And in the discipleship program, we know about five kids every minute. Every 12 seconds, someone comes to know Jesus. Wow. Make the world a more effective, God-honoring place through coaching. Bam, this is the assignment. This is the mission that God has me on now. And you know what? He may swap this out at some point. But whatever he swaps in for it is gonna fit within this, which is gonna fit within this. The calling to be surrendered to Jesus, the purpose, who God made you to be in your personality and your giftings and your passions, and then the mission. The story of David illustrates this beautifully. When you are, let me say this first, when you are surrendered and know who you are and what God has made you for, he reveals his mission to you. David, Before he's king, shepherd kid. Probably, as you read the story here, pre-Goliath, the the pre-Goliath story, probably pretty nosy shepherd kid. Poking his nose in big brother's business. Now he's on his dad, hey, go take him some food. But he's not just, okay, guys, see you later. He's hanging out. And Goliath is mocking Israel. This Philistine, Goliath, mocking Israel. David's like, indignant. Come on, let's go. I I can do that. And the leader of the army said, wait, you're you're a shepherd kid. 1 Samuel 17, 34. David said, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him. And I struck him. And delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose, arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. David's purpose, be a shepherd. Be a fighter. That's what he did as king. David had that purpose in his life pretty carved out. And he would not let God be defiled. He was fully surrendered to the Lord. And his mission that day wasn't to kill a lion or a bear. He knew he could do that. His mission that day was to slay Goliath. And what happened? Timber. 
Goliath was slain with some rocks. Wow. Folks, when you are fully surrendered to Jesus and walking with him in relationship then to discover in your calling and discovering your purpose, what he made you to do and to be, the missions, the assignments, they're gonna come. They're gonna, they're gonna come. Honey, 10 years ago, did you ever expect I'd be working for Operation Christmas Child? It was a lightning bolt out of nowhere, wasn't it? I literally am like so desperate in the terrible job I was in. I loved everything about Arizona. And people say, what didn't you like? I said, my job. And they asked me, what did you do? I was a pastor. Well, that's not really what you want to say, right? I sent out a grand total. I'm like so desperate. Thinking, okay, I'm gonna rev up life coaching business again. Uh, we'll see if there's any sort of Christian leadership positions in Phoenix. And there's one to work there in Phoenix as a coach for Operation Christmas Child. I sent out a resume, and I didn't get the job. I'm crying on my way back from the interview because <laughs> it was a terrible interview. A couple weeks later, they called, hey, Matt, we see that you've worked in New York and Ohio, and we'd love for you to consider those opportunities. God, because I was aligned to the calling on my life, surrender, and the purpose of my life, what he made me to do, the mission came. Hey, let's stand and pray together. Father, I love you. Lord, I'm so humbled to be here today just to share my story and share the glory of who you are and who you may be. Lord, as I look around this room right now, there are people who I know have not received that calling in their lives yet. They have not surrendered all they are to all you are. Hey, if that's you right now, just take this moment. We're standing here with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. It's just you and God just talking. Just tell him, God, I want to surrender myself to you today fully. I need to repent. I need Jesus to rescue me. Some of you here are, are surrendered, but you don't know what the purpose is. Figuring out that purpose for your life, it's a mystery. Start talking to God about that right now. God, for those folks, I just pray that you would pour out your very obvious, what the giftings are in their life. Show them. Even today as they're interacting with people, show them how you've gifted them. Give them clarity about who they are as people and their personality. Give them opportunity to do things for your glory and things they're passionate about. And then folks, the, the, the missions come. And you might be between missions right now. You might be sensing the end of a mission. God, for those folks, just make it really clear. Drop the next mission on them. And when it's dropped on, let them see with such clarity. Yep, that's for me. Killed the lion, killed the bear. This Philistine's gonna be like one of them. I did these other things. Now, God, you've, you've lined it up for me to do this. Today, prayer team's gonna be here. We have some of our pastoral staff team and ministry staff team that'll be here too. If you today for the first time said, yep, I surrender, do me a favor. Go seek out Scott or Caleb. I'm not sure where Dylan is. Seek out Dylan, anyone on church staff here. Let them know, hey, I surrendered fully to Jesus today for the first time. If you feel like you're bumping around in the dark in this idea of purpose or mission, man, our prayer team would love to pray for you. I love this prayer team. They, in my own life, have prayed healing over me and my sister. They've prayed for peace for me as a husband and dad. These are powerful men and women of God who God's just anointed them to have their prayers heard and proclaimed. So come to and seek prayer from them today. Father, we love you. Thank you, God, for calling us. Thank you for giving us purpose. Thank you for showing us your mission. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week.